Good morning, everyone. Happy Thursday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. I do truly appreciate you being with me. Uh, hope, you, hope, hope you've had a great week. Hope you're going to have a great weekend. Okay, uh, listen, I told, I've been urging you to do a concordance study, whether electronic or the good old Strong's, uh, which is right there. I still use it occasionally when uh, the electronic stuff fails. <laughs> uh, so, pardon me. We are focusing on and we are continuing our study of the Olivet Discourse. Is the Olivet Discourse divided into two subjects? Is it a discussion of the coming of the Lord and the judgment of Old Covenant Israel in AD 70? And then is it a discussion of the end of the world, the end of the Christian age, as is posited by most post-millennialist, most amillennialist? Dispensationalist as a group believe that the entirety of the Olivet Discourse, with the, I mean, with the exception of just, you know, about three or four verses in Luke 21, is all about the end of the Christian age. Well, in that Olivet Discourse, in the section that amillennialists and postmillennialists tell us refers to the second coming of Christ at the end of the Christian age, we had the prediction of the coming of the Son of Man for the wedding. I've been sharing with you over and over about how that promise of the coming of the Lord for the wedding is nothing other than the promise that God would remarry Israel in the last days. Go back and look at the video on the relationship between Hosea 5 and 6 and Revelation 21. And you see, Matthew 25, 1 to 13, is absolutely directly parallel also with Revelation 21, 1 and following. Now here's what that means. If it can be demonstrated as we proved yesterday definitively, if it can be proven that the time of the wedding, i.e. the coming of the Lord of Matthew 25, 1 to 13, the time of the coming of the Lord for the wedding was in A.D. 70, then first and foremost, Matthew 24 and 25 are not to be divided into two subjects. It is but one subject, and that's the end of the Old Covenant age in A.D. 70. Secondly, it demonstrates that the book of Revelation is about A.D. 70 because the book of Revelation is about the time of the wedding of the Son of Man at His coming. Revelation 19, 7 and following. Revelation 21, by the way, at the end of the millennium. One of the things that I have suggested to you, and, and of course one of the objections that is often lodged against covenant eschatology is, look, Revelation 21, yeah, okay, it's about the wedding. And oh, by the way, I, I've, I've got to point this out. Uh, in my fellowship of the Churches of Christ, there, there's all, there has always been a tremendous controversy about the wedding. There are some who have proposed that Christ married, fully married, the church at Pentecost. Because it has been argued if Christ did not marry the church at Pentecost, then there could not be children born after that that were legitimate, had to be married to have children. Others take the position, no, Christ betrothed the church to, him, to himself at Pentecost. An appeal is made in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul says to the church at Corinth, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy for I have, I have espoused you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. So here is Paul writing years after Pentecost saying that the betrothal, not the wedding, but the betrothal had taken place. And yes, I know that a betrothal was a legally binding document. That's not the point. They're still not married. And so that controversy has swirled. Well, let me tell you, the view that says Christ was married to the church at Pentecost flies fully in the face of Revelation 19, 7 and 8, at the, that at the destruction of Babylon, i.e. Old Covenant Jerusalem, let us be glad and rejoice for the time of the wedding has come. 
not the time of the betrothal, not the time to prove that the wedding had taken place, but the time of the wedding has come. And that wedding took place, Revelation 21, 1 and following, when the new Jerusalem came down from God out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, argument is given, objection is given. Well, uh, if that's the case, then Revelation 21, 4 must be true. That at this time of the wedding, at the time of the coming of the new Jerusalem, there is no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, etc. Revelation 21, 4. Well, okay, then once again we have a problem with the traditional view. If you say that the Lord is married to the church right now, then that means Revelation 21, 4 is fulfilled. No matter what your concept of death, pain, sorrow, tears, etc. might be. And if we are not in the time of no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears and sighing, if that has not become a reality, then the Lord has not married the church. Well, once again, that's problematic. So, I want to share some just, <laughs> my goodness, just a very, very few of the Old Covenant passages that spoke. Now, the passages I'm going to share with you this morning are messianic prophecies. They are the background, they are the source for Revelation 21, the time of the wedding. And I'm going to have to be brief here, all right? And I, I just went to Bible Gateway, and I'm going to share with you several Old Testament passages that speak of the time of joy. In some of these same passages, we, we find the prophecy of no more tears, no more sorrow, no more sighing, no more death. For instance, in Isaiah 25 and verse 8, at the time of the resurrection, the Lord says, I will remove all tears. Okay, well, so the time of no tears is the time of the resurrection. Well, that agrees perfectly with Revelation 21, doesn't it? Because the new heaven and the new earth, the new creation is the time of the resurrection. To put it another way, the, re <coughs> the resurrection brings in the new creation. That's what Revelation 20 teaches us. Revelation 20, great white throne judgment, resurrection, new creation. Okay? So in Isaiah chapter 25, we have the prophecy and the prediction of the resurrection and the time of no tears. Well, guess what we also find in, Re in Isaiah 25? In Isaiah 25, 1 to 3, we have the prediction, and it's a last day's messianic prophecy, of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Just like Revelation presents the destruction of Babylon and the resurrection. See, all of these passages are incredibly linked. And when you start connecting the dots between all of these passages and you see how the New Testament is using those passages, you see where the New Testament is connecting all of those dots, then the narrative is unified, it is harmonious, and it is irrefutable. I've got to hurry. Okay, in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 15, the Lord speaks of how Israel and Jerusalem, now this is speaking of a future destruction of Jerusalem, okay, because Jerusalem is not destroyed by the Assyrians. So, whereas you have been forsaken and hated, so that no one went through you, I will make you an eternal excellence, a joy of many generations. Isaiah 61, boy, I tell you, Isaiah 61 is just fantastic. And you know what? It's all I'm going to be able to have time for this morning. Uh, but I will get to more next week. Isaiah 61 and verse 3. The Lord is coming. The Lord is going to come. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, that I may preach good tidings of glad things. Now, here's what you need to know. 
in Luke chapter 4, 16 and following, Jesus stood up, took the scroll of Isaiah, and began to read it, read from it, and he read from Isaiah 61. He read from these verses. Now, he didn't read every single verse. But he said, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and he sat down. He closed the scroll, and he sat down. But first he said, today, this is fulfilled in your sight. Folks, listen, that means the time of no tears, no pain, no, no sorrow, no death had arrived. I'd like to comment a whole lot more on Isaiah 61, but time permit, won't permit this morning. Okay, so to continue reading in Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him that he might console those who mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. So you're going to take away all sorrow. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Isaiah 61 and verse 7. Instead of your shame, you shall have honor. Boy, there's a lot of stuff packed into that. Anyway, and instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double everlasting joy shall be theirs. Now watch carefully. Please catch the power of this. Bring Matthew 25, 1 to 13 to mind. Bring Revelation 21, 1 to 4 in mind. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Notice the joy, etc. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, let us be glad and rejoice because the time of the wedding has come and the bride has made herself ready. She clothed herself. What is her clothing? It is the righteousness of the saints. Oh, okay. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, Isaiah 61. Can you connect those dots? They're connected. I'm out of time. Folks, listen to me. This is such beautiful, beautiful imagery. And it's all connected. And what this means is, guess what? Matthew 25, 1 to 13 would be the fulfillment of the ministry of Christ. And it would be the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. Okay? But Revelation 21 would be the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. But Revelation 24, the time of the wedding, would be at the destruction of Babylon, the city where the Lord was crucified. Therefore, the fulfillment of Isaiah 61, which began in the ministry of Christ. See, we have a process of fulfillment. A process of fulfillment. Isaiah 61 wasn't fulfilled, every word of it, in one day. No. No. It began to be fulfilled. Jesus said, this day is a scripture fulfilled in your sight. Well, the great day of vengeance wasn't fulfilled that day, and that's part of the text. The wedding wasn't that day. That's part of the text. Process of fulfillment. Okay. Don't forget our April 2021 two-book special, Save Yourself $25. Go to my website, a banner up at the top for Sam Frost's great book, Essays on Eschatology, my book on Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, Future or Fulfilled. Take advantage of it. U.S. orders only, but save yourself $25. Okay, out of time. God bless you. Have a safe weekend. I'll see you next Monday.